you mentioned earlier this kind of notion of military historians of the war should understand memory and memory historians should understand the war to kind of understand these falsities that exist. Now, that's the one part that I really kind of was struck by as I was reading through your book and kind of like I'm thinking here about source material, kind of reading through your source material. How do you do it? It's like you, it's, you're- It's a great question. You're looking at lies, but you have to figure out whether they're lies or not. And yeah. when is reality not reality, but when is it reality? Yeah, it, it is a tricky aspect of the research. And there are a lot of dead ends, to be honest. There's a lot of times where you find a story and you go, this doesn't pass the smell test, but I can't find the evidence to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so you just, you got to move on in that case or, or be appropriately sort of circumspect when you write about it, saying like, we don't know for sure. I mean, there's a lot of these stories where it's like, something's fishy going on yeah. and maybe you know maybe they're not lying entirely maybe they're just changing the story to make it more believable like maybe mm -hmm. they went to war when they were 12 but they changed their age to make them going to war at 16. it's still a lie but it's yeah. it's maybe they really did serve but they, they recognize how the world works right and that's mm -hmm. that's one thing i think there's two aspects of this one is any individual lie you find in and of itself almost is incidental and so if I'm wrong about one of these lies, and perhaps some scholar will come back and say, you're wrong about this lie, or you're wrong about that lie, this was actually the truth, and I'm sure someone will, um, that almost doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, what matters is that the, the great weight of the way that these lies shape the master narrative. Mm -hmm. That's what's interesting, and that certain tropes come out. You start to see these tropes again and again, and, and you maybe... Maybe some of them are true. Maybe, you know, 12% of them are true, but the other 90% aren't. So how to find them is the second part of this issue, right? Of how do you find mm -hmm. lies? And the, um, it varied from chapter to chapter. Um, a lot of it's deep research, just to be honest. It's archival research. Um, so in the case of sort of looking at Julian Carr's speeches, I went, into his I went into the letters as well to look at how he came about these numbers. When he was there saying, this is how many people serve for the University of North Carolina, I went into the letters at the University of North Carolina and found the letters where he's writing about, hey, do you know how many men served? And someone writes back and says, no, I don't know, but I guess it's probably at least 500. And he writes back, okay, I'll say 1,000, um, right? And so you find those letters where it's, they're admitting their lie. That's always the nicest when you can get that smoking gun. Sure. The other way you do it is you find um, sort of enough circumstantial evidence to convince yourself something's not right. And, and a lot of this is finding documents that contradict each other and so for instance with the issue of age the easy way to do that when you're like all right is this guy really a confederate veteran and he says you know i'm 112 um well when they're 130 you know something's up right but when they say i'm 100 and you're like all right so he's 100 maybe he is 100 there are some 100 year old confederate veterans that are legit mm -hmm. but when you start what you do is you then go back and you look at their census records and you find them in the census every decade and what you see is you find them in the census every decade is that their age suddenly starts expanding in 1920 right? They're remarkably consistent that they were born in 1855. Every year they're saying that until 1920. And then suddenly they're like, I was born in 19, in 1840, right? And you're like, okay, wait a minute. Doesn't make sense. Why is this changing? Well, it's at the same time he starts applying for a pension, right? That he mm -hmm. changes his age. Um, and so a lot of it actually required when you start talking about the, the pension records, genealogical research, mm -hmm. um, is I had to look to figure out who were these guys. Um, and, and, I have, I'm, and this is an interpretive decision, I should be clear, right? Because in theory, they were, you could also argue those, pension, those, those uh, census records were wrong and he was not lying all along. Mm -hmm. But my interpretation of this is when someone says that they're five years old in 1860 and says that they're 15 years in 1870, that is less likely to be a lie. Mm -hmm. It's highly unlikely that you're gonna mistake a 15 year old for a five year old. Mistaking a 90 year old for a 100 year old is easy, right? And so for me, the earlier censuses, when I look at them, I think it may be off a year or two, but it's highly unlikely it's gonna be off more than say five, 10 years in those early censuses, um, because you don't mistake a 10 year old for a 15 year old. Uh, you might mistake an eight year old for a 12 year old, I mean, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But when you when you said, suddenly say, oh, I was 20 in 1860, and it's like the census said you're five. Like that's not believable anymore, right? 
And so I did look for the most obvious cases. I mean, and so I think there are a lot that I missed. Um, I made a point of when I was doing statistical analysis, they, I used, I had a, a, in some ways a lower standard, you might argue, of, all right, this guy said he deserted. I might, maybe he didn't desert. Maybe the records were wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are some cases, but for every record that's wrong, where it says, all right, this guy was lusted as deserter, but he shouldn't have been. How many more records are there going to be of guys who deserted later in the war and there's no record of it? Mm -hmm. And so I actually think my estimates are conservative, mm -hmm. not, uh, and, and they actually probably were more uh, and not less. But I tend to use as examples the most egregious cases mm -hmm. um, because they are the ones that illustrate it best. Mm -hmm. um, and so perhaps the cases I use aren't always the most typical. I mean, and I, I'm sure some graduate student will complain in a seminar at some point that I used, you know, these atypical cases um, as graduate students are wont to do. Uh, but I think those extreme cases help illustrate um, mm -hmm. larger cases. And I think in some cases these, um, I also tried to find cases that had been incorporated into history when possible, mm -hmm. um, or at least into memory, cases that don't just disappear. So for instance, while looking at um, black Confederates, the myth of black Confederates and how they, and sort of these loyal slaves that get converted into soldiers in the memory of, of neo-Confederates today, um, I tried to pick the ones that they trumpet the most mm -hmm. um, and the ones that they trumpet as the last Confederate. And so to me, you pick the ones that are really are the most exciting. So or the case of uh, Edward Cooper, uh, the artilleryman who never existed, which has been cited in 20 history books. So that one, that one made sense to include because it not only was it so common in Julian Carr's papers and every other dedication. I mean, this is when everyone picked the story up. Everyone was telling the story about Edward Cooper by 1910. I mean, it's like a favorite of every Confederate dedication. Um, but Julian Carr is doing it a bunch. Other people are doing it. Um, but it's one that survived into our historiography. Um, and so, um, so it was difficult. I mean, it really required a lot of research uh, and a lot of comparing wartime records. When you're looking for pension fraud, it's all about looking at their CSRs, and other documentation versus their pension record and finding the CSR and just cross-checking a lot of cross-checking. Um, it took a lot of time, you know, taking a sample. I used one County to do my statistics. Um, I'm sure other counties would give you more, but then I found examples elsewhere as well to write about. Right. And so I think there's a lot of room to write more about these topics. Someone needs to look at pension fraud in Mississippi. Someone needs to look at pension fraud in Georgia. We know that the Georgia, uh, inspector of pensions thought the pension fraud was rampant. Mm -hmm. So this is a project for someone else to do, right? I mean, this is just, it's a, a simple methodology of comparing the wartime records to the pension records and then saying, which one do we trust? And always when you read a document, you always think the first thing you think is what is the purpose of this document? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to pensions, the purpose of that document is to get money and you got to start with that understanding. Whereas the purpose of military records of muster rolls is to keep track of who's there. Mm -hmm. And so which do you trust? You trust the muster roll. Now the muster rolls are terrible, don't get me wrong, but uh, they're, they're terrible in a way that frequently guys who deserted aren't mentioned as deserters um, has been my experience um, researching it.